Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is not your normal Sunday, and this is not your normal Sunday show. He's R. Wayne Steiger, who you know and love at, at the R. Wayne Steiger channel. Uh, please go over there and subscribe. And me, well, I'm just Jeffrey Darty. Glad to be here with you again, Wayne. It's always an honor and a privilege. Daniel Richardson, thank you, sir. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Jeff. How are you, buddy? I think I need some counseling, Wayne. <laughs> well, let's just, well, who are we going to call? Snoopy in? <laughs> yeah, for yeah. a dollar, right? The doctor is in. Yeah, the doctor so is in. I got invited to be a part of this elite cadre of mostly spiritual men, you know, trying to be above, trying to be beyond, trying to be the best of the best, right? And they are. I mean, I've been in it for about a week, and it's a good group of guys. And I was enjoying, you know, the, you know talking about David Hawkins and talking about the Emerald Tablets and talking about, you know, a lot of spiritual stuff. And then this morning, these guys that are the best of the best, the elite, start, it goes into locker room banter that was positively Trump-esque. <laughs> and I was so shocked and I was so upset and I was so disappointed. Wayne, am I just getting old? No, no, no. It's, it's a matter of expanding your perceptions. And, you know, I did a video uh, yesterday and about the reality, the reality we're born in. Why yes. is it the way it is? Money, the necessity. It's really a, a reality of survival. It is. And, you know, it's so often, I told someone on Friday, I said, they asked me about Trump and I said, listen, He's just another president. I've known many of them, and I said, you know, I don't get twitterpated one way or the other. And I think what I'm trying to say to you is maybe just get a different pair of glasses and see where their perspective inside their heads. Um, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you know what I, I really enjoy about our meetings is you know we're coming up. I think in August last year was the first time we did, or may have been in July. We need to get the date, but it's coming up here one year. And people can go back and they can see how, how I would call knowledge is processed and internalized. And I mean that specific, spe specifically, I can spell it. Easy for you to say. Yeah, exactly. Um, Look at our journey in a year's time. You've had what I would just call uh, leaps and bounds in, um, I think, awareness and uh, a much more fuller you. Wayne, that means a lot coming from you, sincerely. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's, you're enjoyable to be around. You know, and I wasn't that you before. before. I mean, honestly, I wasn't before. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, listen. Um, you know, the reason why we have files is to make the metal sharp. Mm, isn't that the truth? Yeah. And you have been a file for me at times, and I appreciate that. Well, and, and vice versa. But you know what? I think that this is what hopefully people will see is that it establishes a forum of respect. And respect can then lead to admiration, and admiration then can absolutely begin to tear down the boundaries. That's true. And Wayne, I have to share this with you. Um, a couple of days ago, for the first time since it was either 1999 or 2000, I dropped below 200 pounds. I now today weigh about 195, 194. Excellent, buddy. Amazing. Just amazing. That's it. There's no story there. No moral. That's it. No, actually, there is. I mean, I, so often... Everything is related. I see a lot of depressed people. I see mm -hmm. a lot of people. In fact, I commented on one of your mantra mornings. On I one, saw that, yeah. Yeah. And I was so taken back by the individual's words that it, it brought out something for me is that when we see people bound by fear, bound by depression, oppression, um, is that the body is going to respond exactly as to what the inner person is. Wayne, that's so profound. I've been doing a series that it's interesting. I saw it come up on Daily Ohm. I get their emails. 
and it was a a course for women and it was called um breaking the bonds of past lovers and as soon as i saw it i knew i had to buy the course i spent money on it and i've expanded a little bit you know breaking the bonds of past lovers for women for men that love women like their daughters their sisters their their grandchildren and for men that have been mistreating them and the whole thing that is coming just slamming to me is that because of the way our culture has treated women because the way our culture has treated men and because the way we've begun to treat each other we have forgotten ladies women have forgotten their essential sacredness and the sacredness of their sexuality and the sacredness of their body and Wayne we both know that if the ladies forget it the men are never going to bring it up and we've got mm -hmm. to the place where the women have forgotten how sacred they are and the men are taking advantage of it and and planting flags metaphorically into sacred ground that is not theirs and women are walking around with a lot of bondage and pain and hurt and shame and so are men because when you take in this sexual energy even if it's just emotional or if it's actually physical it comes in and it stays in and when you just hit on it people don't understand this but it will manifest as physical dis-ease physical maladies unless you take care of it and we don't even realize it's there so i find this to be amazingly profound and maybe that's why i'm so sensitive to the you know the boys will be boys which boys may be boys but we're supposed to be men wayne well, I'll tell you what the problem is, and this goes back, <clears throat> I guess we're now hitting two millennia. Right. Our species, the males, we don't, there used to be this rite of passage from childhood into manhood. Today in the modern world, we no longer know what that means. It's homogenized. To Can you explain that a little bit deeper? Yes. So... It's vitally important as you read about men and boys is that in cultures, and, and it's still practice in uh, a lot of the tribes in the Amazonian forest, um, many of the Messiah, the uh, natives of people of Africa. Right. There is a rite of passage. And by the way, there's a correlation to this to the Jewish religion, you know, when you have a bar mitzvah. Um, right that there is a purpose and a reason why a boy has to go through the rite of passage into manhood. And unless that becomes established in the boy, the boy will always be a boy. He will become a man, but he will perceive the woman through a boy's perspective. He will see the world business, everything he does will be through a boy's perspective. And this is what we have today. Today, we have men that are 70 years old that never went through the rite of passage of manhood, and thus they're boys at the age of 70, 80. And unless that happens, it's the same thing with womanhood. You know, when a woman begins to go through the cycle um, cultures used to teach that the women folks, and I'm not, I just read, right. but would, there was, again, this initiation process of her going from a girl now into womanhood. And I think that that's the key word there, H-O-O-D. It's a hood. It is. And far be it for me to quote the false apostle Paul, but I mean, even a a blind squirrel finds a nut now and again, especially if he steals it from somebody else. But True. Paul wrote that when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Exactly. And that didn't come from Paul. No, that no. That straight from source. And that is, we do have to, maybe that's the message for me to convey to that, to that group. It's taught when we become a man, we put away childish things and base things and mundane things and profane things. And we be, try to be, and we do everything we can to be sacred centered men. Yeah. I mean, we've lost the, you know, mentorship. It's something yeah. I see all the time. And yet, you know, remember when you used to have the boys club, boys and girls clubs? Don't yes. have them anymore. Um, we don't have the big brothers, big sisters. Um, we have become so debased as a society, thinking that we're so tolerant, but we've become the most intolerant we have. society. 
And all of this starts back in childhood. Absolutely. Wayne, do you have any daughters? I do not. No? Okay. No. If you did have a daughter, what would your advice be to her for finding a real man to be a mate? Wow. You know, as I look back on my life, um, because of my circumstances, I thought love existed within sex. And what I found was that there were many females that were looking for the same thing. Interesting. And what we, and what I encountered through, you know, I was a very sexual active individual because that's where I thought love was to be obtained. Right. And unfortunately it's not, it, you know, I, I tell people today, if your relationship starts out on a physical basis, give it up. I mean, at, at some point in time, it's going to become stale. You sound like me, Wayne. Well, it's just practicality. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, the relationship I have with my wife is more deeper, more profound, more um, anchored in the fact of who we are as individuals, not uh, based on our sexuality. You know, Wayne, and as I'm, you know, entering into this relationship with Sandra, you know, been several months now, well, if you count four to be several, but at any rate, what I find profoundly different and distinct in this relationship and why I know it's the one, you know, the one is she's absolutely gorgeous. Our physical relationship is absolutely off the charts. And yet that's not what it's about. It's about the, the deep conversation. It's about the intimate partnership. It's about the intimate work together. It's about being best friends. It's about knowing what each other is thinking at the same time. It's about having goals and dreams that align. And in a real, true, sacred relationship, as beautiful and as powerful and as alchemical as the physical union is, it's really just the proverbial icing on the cake, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think so. And I used to say something when I was preaching and every now and then I, I said something that was actually true when I was preaching that was actually helpful to people. I used to make this statement and I, I want to throw it out there for evaluation between you from you and the chat room. I used to make this statement that if you look at your relationship and the development emotionally, the development spiritually, the development intellectually, that your relationship will never advance beyond the level where it was when you first started having sex. I think there's some foundation to that. I do. Um, how I look at things today is that I have found the mind, the soul, um, to be more titillating in its experience and its deliverance of uh, satisfaction. Uh, than any physical relation has. And I'm not against physical relationships. And listen, it's, it's part of, I think, the package of us getting to be here. Absolutely. And, you know, I grew up in the time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, I, that, that was my culture, uh, was immersed into it. And along that way, you know, I, I was, you know, I remember the children of God. I remember the Jesus people. I remember always within that culture that so many of us came out of um, is we were always wanting to reach the spiritual. And even today, some people look at sex as a shortcut to get to that spiritual place. And I, you know, unfortunately, it falls short every time. <laughs> so it does fall short every time. It really does. Yeah. And it's a poor substitute. Yeah. But you know, Hey, listen, there, there's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and we just, again, the advantage of getting older, the more days you're allowed to walk this planet, the wiser you should be coming. And now the mystery for me is, is to examine what makes that so special? There is something that, you know, philosophers, religious um, ideologues, um, even those into the occult have looked at 
you know, the sexual union, mm -hmm. man and woman. And granted, I still don't know if we've fully comprehended it. I think if we could actually see in the full light spectrum, I think it would blow us away because I think at that point, I still say that there are those momentary portals opened up, Jeff. I don't know. Can I take exception with one thing you said and, and discuss it a little bit? Sure. When we're talking about, you know, sex, that it's really fun. And my perception as I get deeper and deeper into this is even though we think profane sex, just getting laid, mundane sex, yeah, we're not really in love, but we have sex. At the end of the day, when we sit back and we analyze it, Wayne, and you made this statement a few months ago, and it stuck with me a few months or a few weeks, you said that there was too many voices on the planet and there was this cacophony. Mm -hmm. I think you were really close, but I, I, in my mind, I tweak it a little bit because I think that, um, I think that it's actually more, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying it's more than just the voices because when we do profane sexuality, when we watch pornography, when we do the autoeroticism involved with pornography, when we're in sexual relationships that are profane and that are mundane, sex is always creative, Wayne, and I'm editorializing. Sex is always creative. You always create something. And whether it's porn, masturbation, mundane, profane sex, you are creating. And what you're creating, literally, and Toth talked about this, a lot of other people besides Jeff have talked about this, you're actually creating tulpe, thought forms, physical, well, not physical, they're, they're etheric, energetic essences that you're creating. And from all of this pandemic pornography and pandemic mundane and profane sexuality, we're actually living in a world that has this thick fog of low frequency created energetic essence from pornography and mundane and profane sexuality. And people are saying all the time, oh, I see shadow men, I see corners. You're creating this stuff and you're wading through a thick fog. And I think that it's not only the cacophony of voices, but it's this intense, incredible, spiritual, just darkness and blackness and sludge. It just reminds me of black goo. Maybe black goo comes from me and you. And if we continue to do the porn, if we continue to do the mundane and profane sexuality, we will continue to poison our own wells and we're trudging through quicksand. Sooner or later, it turns into a, what is it? The La Brea tar pit. And we'll go down if we don't insist on going up. Too hot, too much, Wayne? Too hard? No, I mean, I, I think number one, when you define pornography as what? Is it the filming of a sexual act between a male and a female? And I'll follow I agree me with Sandra. That. She says porn is a demonic frequency. Well, but then I'll take you back to um, 1 AD that, you see, the thing that I have, the reason why that the, the, the physical Christ never walked or whatever, people don't understand. People of Judea under the kingdom of Herod were the most literate people of the entire Roman Empire. So they knew how to write, they knew how to draw. So here's the thing, archeologists have found on the Roman highways that Rome built throughout their whole empire, you know what they found along the rest stops and the, what we would call today the roadside cafes, because they were just like it was here today, they found pornography. Graffiti, yeah. So how long have we been in this, Jeff? I mean, by your definition, we're already in the tar pit. I think you're right. We are. And I think that we may be like that saber-toothed tiger. And a saber-toothed tiger is a powerful animal. A saber-toothed tiger is a you know, powerful spiritual being. But even a saber-toothed tiger can't pull him or herself out of a tar pit once they get in too deep. And the question is, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I'm all about positive. I'm all about optimistic. You are divine. You are sovereign. You are free. But as divine as you can be, as sovereign as you can be, as free as you can be, there will be a point where you wade into a tar pit and you are not going to be able to get yourself back out. Well, aren't we already there? I mean, my, my point to this was, is that if we found quote unquote pornography, mm -hmm. and I, I, I sometimes have to remember 
we, you and I have a foundation where we're still, no matter how you look at this, you're still predicating it upon a religious doctrine of what pornography is. Listen, I believe that there are some people, and I'll speak of Paula White with mm -hmm. her husband, the uh, former uh, singer of uh, Journey. Uh, you know, he said that they use pornography all the time in their bedroom to stimulate their sex life. Is that wrong? Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, what I'm trying to say on this is when we look at this, we're building it on a perception and a foundation that apparently has failed for the last 2,000 years and, and who knows prior to that. We seem to be no further along than where we were 2,000 years ago. Yeah, we probably digressed. I've got to encourage people in the chat room to play nice. But Wayne, um, you know, I understand. <laughs> this is a serious subject, and yeah. it's, but listen, it's part of us. Yeah, personally, and Sandra said this in the chat room, I don't think that it's just pornography, that it's any type of titillating media presentation. I don't think we should be looking at Victoria's Secrets. I don't I know I sound like Jimmy Swaggart. I don't think we should be looking at Cinemax and HBO soft porn, you know, after dark. I don't think we should be looking at any of that because let me just put it this way. Anything and everything that objectifies women or men as sexual objects and anything that promotes the profane, which I define as having sex just because it's fun, anything that promotes the mundane, which is, yeah, I don't really love this person, but I'll have sex anyway. Anything that promotes anything other than sacred sexuality, to me, is profane, it's mundane, and it has no place in a person that says they're spiritual. And I'll guarantee to you, Wayne, if you're watching porn, if you're having mundane or profane sexuality, you're not breaking 400 on the Hawkins scale of consciousness. Guaranteed, I'll take your challenge. Well, I'm not challenging anything. What I'm oh, trying not to- you, not you, Wayne, it's been in general. Yeah, I, I try to look at these things. You see, I'm not disagreeing, but I'm I not agreeing. This. This, is, this, is, this is debate, this is discussion, yeah. this is iron sharpening iron. This yeah. is not, nobody's upset, this is great stuff. You see, I, I think we have to step it back even further than that. I mean, mm -hmm. as you were talking, the thought was hitting in my mind. The problem why most Christianity and other religions fail when they try to convert people is that they're trying to come in and do a complete uh, rehab job. They're doing mm -hmm. a remodel on the structure. And, and what they'll do is that sometimes they'll just paint the walls. Uh, but sometimes the mold is so deep that you literally have to strip the walls off and get down to the framing. And then even then, the framing could be corrupt, and thus you need to rebuild the whole structure. That's a complicated process. And when we, when we talk about morality, when we talk about what we would call virtues of character, we're here yet immersed in a culture that where all of this is ingrained virtually from the crib. And it's, it's a problem I think our species has been dealing with far longer than modern man. And yet we seem not to find the answer. Yeah, or maybe we don't want, maybe the answer is right there and is very apparent, but we just don't want to, we don't want to, take it and apprehend it you know i think it's back to the you know i'm writing my book and one of the questions i have is what is the incentive for humanity to be in a relationship with a god i think the only you want me to answer that sure i mean and it's one of the chapters in my book and it's it's one that you when you start to think about it, yeah i'd love to hear it <laughs> gary Gary says it's his channel, you dingbat. That's funny. <laughs> that used to be my line, but see, I don't do that stuff anymore. <laughs> but at any rate... It's just, respect. <clears throat> don't even go there, Wayne. <laughs> but um, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. 
and especially over the past few months. And the only incentive that we have to be um, in a relationship with a God is because, in my view, from the, the more I study, the more I believe this, is that the beings that we, that we identify as gods, and there's good ones and there's bad ones. You've got to sort through the bad ones. If it wants worship, it's not a good God. If it wants to control you, it's not a good God. It, I mean, just basically, if it wants worship, it's not a good God. But there are beings out there that we would identify as gods who are, I think, used to be where we are and are there to help us get to where they are, and that's part of them getting beyond where they are. So there is a, there is a motivation for us to be in union and commu commu communion, at least, with these beings that are there to help us, show us, assist us in our own ascension, but not in anyone that is there to make us worship them. Does that make any sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, someone wrote me this very long email, and uh, I really appreciate it. They did a lot of thought, and they said, him and his wife, they said, you said you reject all the world gods. And they said, that's, they, they said, we've never heard anyone say that, boldly in public. And they said they began to think about that, the world gods. And he said, you never said that you didn't believe in God. You just said you reject these world gods. And I think that what I'm trying to say, Jeff, I think you're on to something. See, I believe Earth. I'm becoming more convinced that Earth is, in fact, a sentient living being. Absolutely. And it's of a different species, a very long-lived species. And, you know, I'm going to say this. I think that we can rise above the whole issue of the purity or sexuality of the individual of our species when we begin to begin to realize that there is something yet greater now awaiting us. Um, because it gets back to this whole point. What's the point for a relationship with a God? And I think I would agree with you. It's to get ourselves in the ascension. I mean, I don't, I'm not coming back. I'm telling you right now, I'm not coming back to this insanity. I, I figured some things out. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the recognition of saying, listen, I ain't coming back. I, I, I got married. Right. If that cycle happens, not going to do it. Now, I want to ask another question. I'm with you, Wayne. I've decided I don't want to come back either. No. I know there's going to be some of us that come back to assist here, but I think my time here is done. Did we lose Jeff? Jeff? And I, whatever's next for me. And I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You just froze. I'm on done us. here too. <laughs> um, no, I have another question then. So, is a covenant or contract required with a God, or is it basically open season, everyone's welcome? I think, and this is just my blink, covenants and contracts with gods are control. They're, they're, they're the trap. Any God that wants a covenant or a contract with you is trying to trap you. Real God doesn't really doesn't need your worship. Real God doesn't want your worship. And real gods, Wayne, to be honest with you, real gods are not that interested in us. They're kind of ambivalent. All they want is the ones that, you know, it's like Travis Thorpe and his analogy about being by the side of the lake and trying to get across the lake and crying out to God, God, please help me get across the lake. They're not even going to listen. But if you build a boat and you build a sail and you build an oar and you start oaring and rowing, and you're about to give out, you can't, you're about to fall in and drown, and you've done all you can do, then the gods might actually say, ah, here's one that's willing to do some work, and then they might be interested. But right now, gods couldn't care less about most of the people on this planet. I'm glad you said that, because it is a premise that, you know where I first heard this, that the concept, and I know this is going to sound strange, I read it back in the 90s when I first read the book by F. Paul Wilson, Night World. Hmm. And it's a great book. I recommend you read it. It'd be one you will not put down. But here was... Fiction? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great book. Uh, trust me. You, everyone, get the book. 
it is one that you literally won't put down. So in the character that becomes the evil manifestation is called Rosalom. And this deity begins to become part of the earth and then begins to affect the earth. Uh, wow. Changes take, uh, gravity holes, a holes opening up in Central Park. And then these hellacious creatures come out of this thing. It's, it's a good book, folks. Trust, trust me. Is that what sinkholes are, Wayne? I won't say anything on that. They, they, we haven't seen the chew wasp come out of it. And anyone who's read the book knows what the chew wasps are. Um, I don't know where the hell Paul Wilson came up with the concept of a chew wasp, but they frighten me even in my nightmares if I, when I think about them. These are hellacious. Paul Wilson? Yes, F. Paul Wilson. So here's the point. Earth, our region of space, is, was in play. That there are these, I, you, all I can say is the best way you can describe it, super consciences. They're above, above life itself. And outside of time. Oh, yeah. And they don't give a rat ass about us. The no, thing is, is that it's a matter of who basically is possessing the region of space, is, which is more important. And where these conflicts come in is because of these opposing forces. So maybe that's what it really is. Because it gets back to my next question, the concept of heaven. What is heaven about? And you know, by the way, Jeff, and you can tell me on this one, I've been doing research into this. The concept of heaven is actually a Christian concept. I think it's a Christian invention, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it doesn't exist outside the realm of Christianity. Wouldn't there, I, I don't even think you could draw a, I don't think you could draw an analogy even between nirvana and heaven, could you? No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I have it in my whiteboards, and because I'm going, I'm going, so wait a minute. I was in this religion for 50 years. So wait a minute. So what is heaven? What's the purpose of heaven? What would it look like? Sorry, I'm answering a question. In the that's chat. all right. Maybe heaven is the absence of suffering. Well, that's, there's an idea. Heaven, Wayne, and, you know, this is a former 20-year preacher that preached heaven all the time. I was all about, you know, pie in the sky in the sweet by and by after you die. And heaven is the carrot that opposes the stick of everlasting burning hell. He heaven is just as much an invention as hell is. And heaven is the, exactly, heaven is the reward for those good little boys and girls that do what they're supposed to do in the fear and guilt control matrix. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do in the fear and guilt control matrix, you go to the place called hell. It's a lie, it's a fabrication, it's a psychological manipulation of a psychopathic, sociopathic, narcissistic religious system and the gods with an S that have been running it for 10,000 years or so. Boy, spot on. And you know, and listen, I, I, I actually had great empathy for uh, the individual that where I made that comment. I mean, yes, I could tell. It, it, it broke my, my, my spirit inside was grieving for this man. I mean, this man is dominated by fear. And, and it's the fear of death. It's that fear of losing out that the, you know, and like I said, when I finally realized that a mistake is nothing more than a metaphor for sin, and how can a mistake in our life, that's how we learn, that's how we grow, be to our positive, but yet at the end, a mistake is going to be the cause for eternal punishment or damnation. Nonsense. And what is a mistake? It's a lesson learned in life. Yeah. It's so a violation. It really a mistake? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I had um, Dr. Tony uh, Pervonage on again, and I love her approach as the divine I am. She said, we have to get above this idea of even forgiveness. There is basically no right or wrong when you get down to it. If you're offended by someone, you get your feelings hurt by someone, it's because you are the one who is in offense. 
not the individual. Say that again, Wayne. Okay. When you are offended right. by another person, right. the offense is not by that other person. The offense is within you. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's interesting because one of the sermons that transformed my life, I don't know if you ever met Larry Huck. No. He was big in TBN. He was in Portland. Now he's in Dallas. But he preached this sermon when I, he was my last pastor, and his sermon was, take no offense. And he went on where, you know, the Christ Jesus, the Lord, whatever you call him, made that statement that um, offenses will always come. And woe to him that offenses come through. So the person that brings the offense is going to have to pay for it. But when people bring you an offense, the, the master was saying, you have to take it in order for it to be effective. And you don't have to take the offense. You can say, no, thanks. I don't want it. But most people, Wayne, when somebody brings an offense to them, they take it, they cradle it, they pet it, they feed it, they grow it. and it, it feels good. Because it feels good to take offense. But yeah. the Lord is saying to you, the master is saying to you, listen. Don't take the offense. And this gets back to what you shared with, with me, you know, a couple of weeks ago about calling favor upon Call your enemy. favor, yeah. Now, look, you know, why you were just saying that, here's this, I mean, literally, I'm seeing the synaptic pathways firing. That, <laughs> that one statement nullifies Christianity in its totality. Which I'll tell you statement? why. The take no offense. Yeah. Because... That means God should not take any offense. But the God of Christianity sure does. Wait a minute. We got two opposing dogmas here in the same religion. Wayne, I, my first wow. entrance into this scene was with the book, Apostle Paul Antichrist, which I was fortunate enough to go on Coast to Coast AM with. And the whole premise of that book is, not telling you what to believe, but the whole premise is that there was a religion, a, a spiritual system taught and espoused by the Christ, the Lord, Jesus, the Master, whatever you call him, and his apostles. And there was a second opposing system proposed by the so called Apostle Paul and his apostles. And there are two separate, distinct religions. And we have to realize that and make a choice which one we want to espouse, but you can't believe them both. And we've been sold a bill of goods that Paul and Jesus were working together. They were diametrically opposed. You're right on, my friend. You know, that's what I hate about it. You know, if I'm going to have mind coitus, I want it to be something that I can get into. That... You at least want to get a kiss first, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or at least a turn around and a hug or something, you know. But the point is, that's... That's the problem. And we were out yesterday and you and Lynn. Yeah. And, and as we observe things now, as we look at things, it's amazing because truly I am looking from the outside in now. Mm -hmm. I am more aware that I'm not here. I know why you're, why that's happening to you, Wayne. Why is that? Because you have a, a deep and profound meditation practice. Is that what that is? Because it's so, I mean, it's got, I mean, the, you know, like you said, the goosebumps have goose. It's yeah. so profound now, even in my sleep. Because when you meditate, and Sandra taught me this about three months ago, you know, when you're meditating, you're sitting on that cushion, and it's, you begin to see what is you and what isn't you. And all these other things that you thought were you, you see that they're out there. They're just things, and they're not you. And you're able to separate from the things and the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions and the itches and the legs going to sleep. And you realize what's you and what's not you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's becoming enjoyable. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the, you know, the best 40 minutes of my day many times. Yeah. And it's, it's so profound at times. Because at the same time, I'll suddenly see something and I'll go, never saw that before that away. Yeah. Yeah. And here we go. It, it's, it's, it's breaking down these things. But let me get back to what we were seeing out in the real world. I realize that the group, the community that we have found ourselves in, that we have, and I think everyone is being drawn 
into this that's diverse. It has multiplicity of opinions. It has a plethora of different type of personalities. But it is a cocoon. It's a, it is a sanctuary because the rest of the world out there, I got to tell you what, they're back crap crazy. I mean, it's the anger. I, I, I saw yesterday, in no, and in where I live, it's, it's, you know, Highlands Ranch, an individual with had so much disregard for the safety of others by the way that they were driving that the, the car was becoming potentially an instrument of death. Absolutely. And for no reason. Yeah, Hawkins says that about 98% of the humans on planet Earth are below a 200 consciousness level, which means they're operating in fear and anger. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Uh, it's just crazy. You know, we have uh, friends in law enforcement, and many of these people that we know now are living in fear. They, they used to go to work. They knew there, there was always a bias, but now many go to work in fear of their lives. Let's talk about that, Wayne, because, you know, a lot of times people, we have a dim view of law enforcement because we see them shooting people that we don't think should be shot. We see them acting with uh, force that we don't think is justified. And it's very easy to see, you know, 8, 10, 12, 20, maybe it's 50 a year of unjust or questionable police shootings. But talk to us about the point of view from the people that put on the uniform every day and go out. Are they really a bunch of jerks that are got sand kicked in their face in high school and they're just out so they can push people around? No, no. And there are a few that get through, but the psych tests now um, are pretty good. They, they have it. They can filter a lot of those individuals out. Let me just tell you of the men and women I know personally. Please do. Um, these are fathers and mothers. I know two women. Um, and it's their way to serve the community. It's, it's a low paying job. Number one, um, the risk are incredibly, if you were doing this on your normal job, most people wouldn't do the job and they feel isolated. They, they come in and they, they really are here is to serve the community, mm -hmm. but it's turned now so violently against these people that, I mean, I know one officer that actually had a Coke thrown at him in a McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> it's so what the sad. hell is wrong with people? Now, these are the same people that if they were shot, they would be calling that officer to come and aid and lend them assistance. Yeah. Now, what would you say to people like Delaney Jackson, who says that still in 2018 in the United States of America, you get pulled over for driving while black. You get stop for walking down the street while black you get stopped for that's shopping bullshit. while black that's nonsense you know what the statistics don't back it up that is rhetoric that is nothing more than a lie and it's offensive that any person would make that because you know what i'm going to tell her what she is you're a racist let me tell you what when you see individuals that begin to say that it's the skin color for the reason that they somehow should be exempt above the law that's racism. That's bigotry. And these men and women, listen, they're not the ones who write the laws. Right. If you don't like the laws, then go and talk to your city council, talk to your mayor, talk to your state representative, talk to your congressman. Okay. Let me ask a follow-up question. Uh, population in the United States of blacks, 17 to 20%. Population in the U.S. prison system of blacks, 80%. Mm hmm. Yeah. Any comment on that? Again, it's not law enforcement. It's the laws. If the reason that you see that equality in those percentages, it's the laws, ladies and gentlemen, talk to your state senator. Listen, this is what I tell every citizen in the United States. If you live in any state, you need to start a campaign in your state that before any state legislator, and this ought to go to Congress, 
Before they can enact any one new law, they have to remove five from the books. Yeah. Because yeah. this is the problem. You've got many people in the South that, unfortunately, the South uses this as nothing more than an illegal tax and what we would call free labor. The prison systems in the United States is a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. Now that it's privatized, especially. So, yes. And we can and thank I don't you, think Obama. Black or white, Wayne, no. I think that per capita on an income basis – they're going at they're going after the brokest people that can't afford lawyers to defend themselves. Yeah. And it's not a black thing, it's not a white thing, it's a poor folks thing. That's I mean, you see, this is what I'm glad you said that because it's not a race situation. This is a class situation. Exactly. You know, when you when you elect these men and women to become your lawmakers, woe unto you. You know, today in the United States Congress. Here's the problem. Every one of them should be fired. They're inept and they're incompetent. They pass bills that no one reads, that no one deciphers, that no one actually determines what the consequence potentially is. And yet we're in a system that it's this way. The perpetuation of today where we have the president under assault because of policies that were invented by the previous administration. Yeah. That's the insanity that we're in. But getting back to your point, it is an economic thing. It's a class thing. And it's not black or white. It's the fact that in many of these places, particularly in the South, is that you have a greater portion of the population that is unfortunately victims of the laws, not the police. Yeah. You know what I hear cops tell me all the time? They don't, everyone thinks that somehow cops are having the pressure by state uh, municipalities to write tickets. No. Now, there are, in fact, some municipalities that will rely on the violators to a heavy extent because right. people have a lead foot. But the point is, they don't like it. They, they, you know, they're not on the job to make a judgment as to what your innocence or not. They look at this as that this is what the law states. You violated it, whether you're innocent or not. Yeah. Ron White, the comedian's like, well, if you're having trouble with the police, you might try obeying the law. <laughs> it's it's and, just you know, something to think about. <laughs> you know, I don't like it either. You know, I I I, I keep up with government. I watched the um, these House Judiciary hearings um, with Rosenstein, and you know, I, I'll just you know how we got onto this. I don't know, but here's the problem, folks. We have. The United States right now is in the middle of a coup that's being exposed. Yeah. We have found out now that the top ranking law enforcement officials of the previous administration, that it may very well go directly to the White House, to the president himself, meaning Obama, that they tried to obstruct the Constitution of the United States. And all the evidence is pointing to that. This is the deep state. And this is what happens when the citizenry begins to see this and those who are not caught up by the rhetoric of the left that try to begin to distract, but those who are beginning to see what happens, this is where we lose confidence. We lose confidence in our laws. We lose confidence in those who are supposed to oversee the laws. And this is what now spreads to what the violence is. Yeah. Wayne, is there any hope for a return to true Jeffersonian democracy in the United States of America? No. You know what the odd makers are giving on the Civil War in the next 10 years in the United States? What's that? A three in five chance. And who would the war be between? Um, class, it would be between us. They're, they're literally getting the lines drawn um, that you're going to have these groups like the Anafata, uh, yeah. these other groups that are now being funded by... Um, well, we know who they're being funded by. Yeah, George and, Soros. Yeah, and when you start seeing the bullets fly in your streets, well, that's going to invoke, Trump is going to, he'll invoke martial law. He's going to screw with it. In a hot minute. And once that sets off, then the agitators get, and this is what concerns me. I don't see any unity. I don't see any unity at all. And when I look at our government, you know, listen, I'll, I'll use the words of what 
the master said, a house divided, and it, didn't, it actually comes from the book of Proverbs, a house yeah. divided against itself cannot stand. A nation divided against itself cannot stand. And look at, you look in the chat rooms, and if you get into a certain topic, what you invoke the ire of is hatred from people. I did a video on love. I had some woman write, well, I can see you're still looking to the stars for love. And I said, you know, before you start commenting on love, you ought to start walking it first. Yeah. You know, and then comment on love. We don't know what love is, Jeff. The average person on the street does not know what love is. They look at love either through materialism, sexualism, anything but the way that it was meant to be. I don't see people out there wanting to forgive people. I don't see people out there going the extra distance. You know, what, what Lynn and I try to do every time that we're in a restaurant and we see a law enforcement officer, we go and buy their meal. Because that's a way of saying thank you. I don't know who that officer is. It's the same way that when I see a poor person that I know on the street, you know, we give money out all the time. And I've had business associates tell me that, well, why are you doing that? You know, it's a con. I said, listen, if I can help feed one person that's not a con, then it makes all the rest of it worth it. Can I tell you a story, Wayne, about yes, that? I was in, uh, I was, when I was an evangelist, I was preaching in Portland, uh, Oregon, and I was on my way to church and there was a dude that was uh, asking for money. And for some reason, you know, I usually don't give money, but I said, okay, I'll give you money if you'll let me pray for you. So I prayed for him and I gave him money. And then, you know, I used to go to the same churches every year. So I went back a year later to that same church in Portland. And after I got done preaching, a guy came up to me, you know, dressed in a nice suit, you know, clean shaven, uh, you know, obviously was, you know, doing well for himself. And he shook my hand and he said, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, sorry, sir, I don't. And he goes, I was the guy that you gave 20 bucks to last year it, it, where you said, I'll give it to you if I can pray for you first. There you go. You know, we don't talk about the generosity of good deeds, and there's many people in the chat room that do the same thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Yeah, Warrior and, Princess is in the chat room. Yeah, and, you know, I'm going to have her back on. We're going to do another um, tele, uh, video fund and raise some more money for her food bank, uh, her food storage. I know we can't call it a food bank, but uh, right. food the story. point is, if... You know, I have a deep concern, Jeff. I, I really do. It's, it's getting very dicey out there. Um, i tell you a story about a law enforcement friend. Their biggest fear is stops, automobile stops, because they have encountered more and more incidents now where the occupants of the car have guns. Ooh, yeah. We lost a officer here uh, a couple of months ago no more than two miles from us, doing a simple pullover. All it was was a speeding. And the person that was pulled over steps out of the car with an AR-15 and starts opening up fire on the officer. What the hell is wrong with people? We see, the, when I hear the stories, folks, you know, and this is what gets me, the violence that's happening in families. And now we're seeing that transcending down to children. When you start reading stories of children, eight and nine years old, committing homicides, I don't know. And I don't have the answer, Jeff, and it, it, it bothers me. You know, I'm going to leave this earth like many others before me with much tears in some ways because it's a release for us. But those, of, uh, those who stay behind, you know, it's, it's very different. Uh, I'll just make this comment, Jeff. I think that we now have 20 years, 30 years, excuse me, of people who have been indoctrinated into video games, into our youth, that where human life means nothing. It's a game. And I think that that's transcended to the soul of our society. Absolutely. And, you know, Jay, 
uh, Campbell talks about that a lot. We've lost a whole generation of men to video games. Yeah. We really have. So r do you wake up in the morning optimistic or pessimistic, Wayne, with all this in mind? Neither. I wake up in peace. I, I know that sounds strange, but I wake up in a place that is, it's nothing. It's neither. I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's weird. I, I mean, there was a time, Jeff, where I, you know, Lynn and I would get up at 4.30 in the morning and do an hour devotion before we got our day going. And, you know, it was always, I tell people all the time, it was always guilt, obligation, or condemnation. And obligation is a big one. Yeah. And I could remember I would wake up and I would quote that verse that David said, you know, the Lord gives sweet sleep to his beloved. You know, yeah. always quoted that over me. But yet I would wake up with the profound sense of guilt that there, you know, there's a need to thank God for this day, but forgive me of my sins. And, you know, you go through that routine. And now I wake up in blissful peace. Hmm. I don't have anxiety. I don't think about the outside pressures. It's, it's weird, Jeff. It's like it's, I can't, uh, the only thing I can tell you, I get the sense more and more, each of us are spirit energies that are balls, they're spears. And I really do think that I'm looking at myself living out this life playing a role that I was destined to play out, not that it was written, it was this the path. How, I, how the lines are written is how I walk the path. So is that, some, is that a sort of predestination? I think it's the path, and the path always leads to an end. So if you want to call that predestination, but the path is not written by my lines. I'll be remembered by the lines that I wrote on this path as I'm walking it. Hmm. And the lines are my actions. Am I growing? Am I beginning to see the wisdom of actions? Can I begin to control a thought of either allowing it to form a negative impulse or reject it and say, no, I'm not going to allow that to influence me. And let me tell you, my personality I am definitely an A personality, an asshole personality. That's how I was for, for decades. Earmuffs. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, there's a softness now, and there's a certain resolve. And I now determine to allow my energy to flow more into my thoughts of exploring life, I guess. How do you feel about that, Wayne? Because that word has been used about me of late, a softness, a gentleness that wasn't there before. And it used to kind of bug me. How's it make you feel? It's weird. It's like putting on a new pair of shoes. Yeah. Yeah. I know they fit, but they're not quite comfortable yet. Are we compromising? No, I don't think so. I think we're growing. Are we backsliding, Wayne? No. I think it's what I'm beginning to understand. If you were to sit in the judgment seat, how do you determine right from wrong? And by whose basis are you making the right or the wrong based on? Mm. I suddenly realized that Jeff Doherty is a sovereign being. He has a uniqueness about his energy. There is the uniqueness of the energy is who the pattern is. I'm different, but yet I've had the privilege of being able to exchange what I would call in the membrane, that energy flow, that transference. And it's, uh, I'm learning that's, I think, how it is. You know, Sandra teaches a, uh, a practice that she calls writing inventory, and you write, that it's, it's a process, you can go to her channel, and she has a video on it about uh, writing technique. And you mentioned it about being the judge, and I've got, I've got about 20 pages of inventory <laughs> that I've written. And the first one, the summation of it is, I'm not going to read it because it's, it's personal, but basically it's me realizing that I'm not anyone to sit in judgment of anyone else and to think that I 
am qualified to sit in judgment of someone else, to think that it's my right to sit in judgment of someone else, is the height of egoic arrogance. And when you don't, when you, and, and, and you're carrying a responsibility that's not yours. Ooh, and if you realize, look, I'm not God, and I am not the person that's going to be judging anybody, when you remove yourself out of the judgment seat and you, you free yourself of that responsibility, which this writing technique helped me to do, it's, it's profound. And you don't have to be, you can be soft and you can be free and divine and sovereign when you don't have to be the judge, jury, and executioner anymore. You, you mentioned something and, and, and Sandra is spot on. I learned this principle decades ago. Um, from uh, Hubaka, two, three, that you have to write the vision down. Yep. And most people that I've mentored in business um, is that they don't know how to write down their visions. Yep. Writing is, it's, I mean, spelling is spelling. It is. It's spelling. <laughs> ah, now you're getting it. Because unless you write it down, it's going to be virtually impossible for you to frame it within your mind. That's absolutely true. I mean, that's why, you know, you know, you look at my uh, multicolored coat, uh, I'm calling it the Joshua coat, um, <laughs> of writing ideas down. And the three well, other ones. It was Joseph that had the, the coat of many colors, yeah, not Joshua. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, Joseph, excuse me. Yeah. Well, Joshua. All right. I always liked Joshua. Listen, if the dude actually fought the battle of Jericho. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk to this dude. This dude saw an astronomical event that defies physical science. He, he saw the earth stop. The earth stop. How in the freak does the earth stop? You know, he saw the sun regress. Now, he did. Now, what, and I know we've gone over our time, but this is what really gets me. The Chinese wrote of the same thing. Wow. So what the hell happened? There is something astronomical that happened to our planet that people aren't paying attention to. And like I said, the Chinese wrote about the same event. They or called it just it, a story, Wayne. No, they called the Chinese called it the longest night. Interesting. Their but day. didn't Joshua say the sun stopped and would have been day? Yeah, it was day in their part of the world, yeah. But oh, I got you. But it was in, night where... Um, in China, it was night. The, 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 the night, the day didn't come. That's really interesting. Oh, yeah. It gets me going, going, okay, so... Wow, so that might have actually happened. I think it may have had. Um, Wayne, if, was Planet X involved? No, no, let me tell you what I think on my theory in Planet X. I think we're... I am convinced that we are still in the midst of a, what we call a galactic collision. I think Earth, and it's just my hypothesis, was part of the Sagittarius Dwarf Ecliptical Galaxy. And I think that we're still in the process of seeing the result of this collision that's still taking place. Hmm. And to answer your question, I believe that what we're seeing in our galaxy, our universe, our quadrant of space is that we're hitting through debris fields. Right now, we know for it's a fact that we are emerging out of a dust cloud. The question is, what awaits for us on the other side of that? I don't know. Wow, that's interesting. So that's why, the, you know, I, I don't, people understand. The Bible is there for you to, I think, number one, I don't get involved in how I can begin to reason a first century mind to my mind today. Two, those are ancient documents that I have seen people pour their whole lives into, and at the end of their lives, they're no better off than they were when they started into it. Three, our galaxy is a wild place. It doesn't stop. So, and by the way, Jeff, why has God stopped writing? Well, you know, I think that he's been uh, deposed, the God that I don't think he really was Yahweh. He was usurping that name. And I really believe that he's been deposed. He's been given a fate worse than death. And he's somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere well, something's else. going on. But and Jeff, I mean, seriously, 
why aren't why doesn't the church or anyone else well number one it would erode their 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 dominance but Mm -hmm. my question is if a god is god he would know she would know it would know that a 22nd century mind 21st century mind would be so radically different from a first century mind that it would require constant guidance and direction. And why, why didn't Jesus write? I've often asked that question. I mean, if anyone was going to write a book, that would be the dude to do it. <laughs> what if the apostle John was really the true word manifest from heaven in flesh and there was no Jesus? Now, I, I would contend that would be more realistic than the fabled story of the Gospels. Yep. You know, I, because I, John is the one that 60 years after all the other apostles finished writing, 40 years after Paul finished writing, John sat down and penned the definitive last will and testament of the apostolic era with the Gospel of John, the, the three books of John and Revelation, the parts of it which he wrote, he wrote what the Messiah would have written if he were real on earth. So that's, yeah. that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, <laughs> it's, it always amazes me that, you know, once you get free of the God spell, the words written by whoever spoke these, they're, to me, they're, they're healing words. Now, I don't you take think the George would want to talk about that on coast to coast. Was the Apostle John really Jesus? I think it's a good, good intellectual discussion. It is a good one. Maybe I'll pitch that to Lisa this week. Yeah. And by the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna call her and tell her that um, you would be a good guest. Well, my contention is this: I believe we do have a God here, and each and every one of us are enslaved in this thing, and I hate it. I feel like I'm inside oh. a, um, do you know what a wolf spider is? No, Wayne, but I got to finish with something. Let finish that story. Go ahead. Now this, I mean, this is, this is definitely super profound, you know, picking up on what you, you know, you taught us a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. How long was that about the calling down favor in your enemies thing? Yeah, about three weeks ago. About three weeks ago. <laughs> Sandra D. Just had a thought. Is it possible that the evil God kept going down the wrong path, quote unquote, because no one offered it favor? Now that is a show in itself. That is something wow. that that's profound. That's deep. Wow. Now you know why I am head over heels in love with this woman. And I just want to say something about ego. People talk about ego all the time. We have to have ego. Ego is what we are. Evil or ego makes a terrible master, but it can be a most efficient servant. Yeah. But that's a good question. Listen. That's powerful. You're if see if that the again. Council of the Elohim came in, why wouldn't a God feel left out, hurt? What if the species that that deity fell in love with spurred it through rejection, and that's what happened? Hmm. Yeah, that's in uh, Final Message of the Last Apostle, by the way. Oh, is it? <laughs> My second book. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, I mean, there's, there's no way to top that. What a very profound yeah. question, and I think that you're probably going to see that again in the future because that is a great question and boy talk about changing your paradigm mm. wow that's something Wayne, i'm convinced jeff i just want to say this please. out of one of these groups a message is going to resonate that's going to be born that will begin to ascend above the noise that will begin to be recognized even by the common person outside of the circle. And you know, I don't say this just because I'm deeply in love with her, but I think Wayne, that it's very possible that Sandra could be that person. Well, I have, listen, we live a life of unrecognized potential. We do. Yes. 
And I know that she had a gifting, you know, back. When did she first come on? Was that in um, January? Um, yeah, probably was December or January. Yeah, December or January. You know, it's half a year has gone by. It has. Holy cow, Batman. <laughs> yeah, she's wondering if the evil God started off good. You know, that's a good question. I think that they can be influenced. I mean, listen, can evil ever become good? Uh, yeah. I, I think it can. A, I went from a, from a, from a, I mean, I used to work for the bad guy. And you know, you know, number one, I don't believe in Satan. Don't believe in Lucifer. Uh, but if that deity existed, are you saying that it's so permanently that away, that means then there is no hope for any of us. That's right. That's right. Not, you're wow. not your normal Sunday mornings, that's for sure. Not your normal <laughs> Sunday show. Deep thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Deep, Deep and profound thoughts. Wayne, please sit there for a moment so I can say uh, goodbye sure. to you personally. Yeah. For Sandra D., I'm Jeffrey Darty. Wayne Steiger. This is not your normal Sunday show. Go to Wayne's channel, Wayne Steiger or R. Wayne Steiger, excuse me, and subscribe. He's on the front of my page, so you can, always, you can subscribe very easily. you are mine. So. Absolutely. And you can, uh, survive, you can subscribe there easily. And Sandra says, let's all forgive someone today. Let's offer peace first and love. You can't add to that. For Sandra D. and Wayne Steiger, I'm Jeffrey Darty. We'll see you again real soon. Your presence here honors us, and we look forward to seeing you again on all three of our channels. Bye-bye.